Hello everyone, welcome to Homemaking Radio. I hope you get a few things done while you listen, and this is hearkening back to the old days, back in the 1950s when we used to listen to the radio while we did the dishes. And today I have a few things to show you and share with you, but if you're new here, please click the link in the description box and go over to the post where I have embedded this video so that you can see the summary and some of the other photographs of the manse and the surrounding areas. Also, if you would like to go and get prepared, I think this is one of the most important things to start your day at home. You know, at home you have to regulate yourself and a lot of people ha are having to get used to this, uh, trying to start their day in an orderly way and use the time as efficiently as they possibly can at home. And one of the things I like to start out with is telling you to go do something with yourself and get dressed and get look your best and feel your best so that you can uh, function in your life at home. Now whether you're working at home or you're a homemaker and you're taking care of your family, you still need to do that because even the maids of the olden days had to get dressed to come to the family home to take care of them. Now today I am also going to share my teacup with you and it is a prairie rose from Canada. You know there probably isn't a country in the world that doesn't have this wild rose growing in their country by the roadsides. I could never get it to grow domestically. It likes uh, it likes a certain kind of soil that we would call it poor soil, but really it's a mineral rich soil. They like to grow in the gravel and other places out of the way. So I'm really proud of this cup because my friend in Victoria, British Columbia sent it to me many years ago. And I did explain to you, someone had made a comment to me, which was very valuable about these small handles. They were not designed to put your fingers in completely. They were designed to touch so that you could feel your thumb and your finger connect. I have had a lot of smart people say, well, why didn't they just make a flat piece? That doesn't work. This is the only thing that really works very well. And so with these antique ones, the small handles were for a reason. They really weren't supposed to be putting their fingers inside of them. And there would be a danger of it getting too hot for your finger anyway. So we we drank out of these the men drank out of them back in the olden days and so today also wanted to uh, share with you the because I always try to choose a teacup to go with whatever I'm wearing for the day and today I am wearing another one of those Laura Ashley dresses that I made from a pattern and I had made this for my daughter with a matching uh, granddaughter dress so that she, they could have a mother-daughter ensemble and the granddaughter outgrew the dress and wore it out. I mean totally wore it threadbare and the mother was left with this so I got it back and I'm wearing it. She's thinner than I am. I have to squeeze tighter <laughs> to get in them. Um, so I want to show, the, show you this dress. It is kind of Jane Austen-y because I want to read something from Jane Austen today. I'm in the mood for it. So I'll show you this, what this looks like. Now if you're not uh, confident in sewing you can find things like this to wear that are made of cotton that work so well around the house you just put an apron on over it. It's quite long and I'm wearing my little Jane Austen boots with it. So I'll just I'll just show you that from the back there. I can't get any I don't have a photographer so I can't get photographs of the of the sewing that I do anymore. I either have to put it on a dress form or just show it to you here. So start out with a scripture that's going to inspire you for today and be sure that you are dressed and because it's a way of facing the world. And I have dug a little deeper in my closet and started to get some of the dressier clothes and wear them because where am I going to wear those, you know? And uh, so I decided to just wear them at home. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is to uh, get dressed up, put an apron on it and clean up everything. And then I have something nice to wear for dinner without having to go change. And But as before I launch into everything that I'm excited about talking today, I want to share my paper, uh, brown paper craft, brown paper challenge that I'm having with my children and grandchildren. I'm... Uh, I'm desperate today. I didn't know what to do, so I took a piece of the brown paper, as you can see, and I made a, a little hanger for it, and I drew a scene on it. 
So there you see there's a little house in the background. I painted a white area there so that I could have a canvas. And then when we all get together, we're going to have, and it's surrounded by roses. One of my favorite types of art are the old fashioned postcards where you'd see the little house in the distance and a little road and then uh, maybe some garden flowers. And then in the front, there'd be uh, surrounding these larger flowers that that went with the background and I've done several of them and I can put a link to you on uh, the page somewhere so you can go and look at either both the paper brown paper crafts and some of the paintings that I have done just little little ones so when they come again we will have an art gallery and so they will have the experience of being able to go to an art gallery that maybe they wouldn't have before so we'll all have art we'll hang them on the on the the backs of chairs, whatever we need to, hang them in the halls and have our own art. I'll give you a picture of that. It isn't, it isn't very good. It was just a rushed sample because I wanted to uh, have my offering for today for the contest. And, uh, and I have a lot more ideas, but I just don't have the time sometimes to, to do them. And another household hint I want you to have is you get some things in the mail. I don't have the envelope with it, but sometimes you'll get something in the mail and the other side will be blank. And uh, on this side will be some, some kind of advertisement. So what you do, what I do, is I fold it like this in three pieces. I don't even have to tear it. And this side will be a list, like a shopping list, which I often collect as I go throughout the day. I'll be cleaning something and realize I've run out of something or that I need a new this or that or I need some more. And, or I'll be in the kitchen working and so I, that'll be my daily uh, list. And then on the other, on another piece of it, there's three pieces. On the other piece, then I'll write down a list of things that need to be done today or make a schedule. And then on the other list, I might write down uh, ideas of sewing that I, I would, that come to my mind while I'm working of things I'd like to make. The other day I was in the kitchen I'm wondering if I could do this with brown paper, but I was trying to push my sleeves up so they wouldn't get all wet or they wouldn't get um, any kind of food on them. And I th remember that I had a pattern for sleeve covers and I've forgotten what they're called. Um, they were just sleeves that you put over your other sleeves and to protect sleeve protectors is what they were called. And I had a pattern for them and I knew how to make them. And so I wrote that down as something that I need to do. And then I, there was a nut, something else that I rem remembered someone's birthday and that, that I had to remember this month to send them something. And so you have your three sections and one can be for your list and of, of products you need to buy or order. Uh, I would divide it into, you know, shopping, ordering. And then the other one could be your list of things you'd like to get done today, uh, calls you want to make. So there you have a piece of paper that comes in the mail that ordinarily you'd throw away anyway and you, you probably wouldn't keep your list so that way I'm not using up valuable uh, list paper you know my kids get me these fancy pads of list paper and I like to use them for special occasions so these these are good and so if you've got that then you don't you can throw them away after you use them once so today I wanted to start out with uh, a scripture that will inspire you and I'll tell you why it inspired me and this is from Colossians 3, verse, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And I'll tell you what, I'll just read it to you and ha see what you, how you uh, accept it. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, that really gives you a higher goal, because let me tell you, ladies at home, and uh, if you're men listening to, to this, it applies to everybody, that people will always let you down. Eventually, somebody's going to let you down, or they're going to discourage you. You cannot work constantly to please someone else um, because it's ultimately, I mean, yes, you can please other people. You can do things for other ple people and try to please them, but do not depend on them to give you your worth in, uh, in praise or thanks because 
they will people will always let you down even in churches don't depend on them don't even even your own family will let you down occasionally they uh they are not always thoughtful and they they of course you have to realize not everyone is like you and not everyone has the same um conscience want, wanting to have a good conscience so they might not always be supportive so this is why this verse inspires me so much it says whatever you do work heartily as for the lord so it's a higher cause we're working for a higher cause and when you have uh god uh lifted up and and you're thinking of a higher goal and something more intelligent and something more fruitful and something more purposeful than the people around you of course when you do your best you are going to please people around you but when you start thinking of it in this respect i'm going to do my best as unto the lord and not unto man for you serve the lord christ now that is worth pondering on so if you have one of those copy books or uh what was it called commonplace book and you're collecting sayings and inspiration this would be great one for your children you don't have to memorize stuff you just have to say them over and over and pretty soon they're committed to memory it would make a good handwriting lesson it would make a good little plaque on the wall it would also be good for a discussion a long discussion whatever you do work heartily as for the lord and not for men knowing that from the lord you receive your the inheritance as your reward for you serve the lord christ now this could apply to people working in other jobs for other people too if ultimately you're trying to do your best and please god and uh, give him a good reputation and and glorify him in what you do then of course you're going to impl- you're going to please the employer because you want to do your best your conscience the trouble with trying to please people is their their expectations are often so limited and often an employee will just try to please what is required of him a very basic nothing beyond that because that's all that's required but when you serve the lord christ there is a entirely different motivation and i think that learning this we learned this in homeschool one of the first days and it just struck me that i had never really looked at the scriptures in that respect you know if your only experience in religion is just going to church you're just not going to get the same balance this doesn't mean you stop going to church but it means you've got to have it every day of your life and i had a i had a little note here on how to how to uh i don't know why it isn't here and it was about overcoming the after church uh letdown and one of the things we didn't realize until we got into homeschooling was there has to be greatness going on at home there have to be uh depth going on at home you have to have your own study and your own bible and your own uh discussions of things going on at home you have to have meaningful activities at home so that you don't have that after church letdown and one of the problems is that we expect the sunday morning um, worship to, to stay with us a long time and for us to feel good about it when we get home and often it doesn't happen that way because you have to have something going on in your life at home that's why i say uh, to start out your day and have your own worship sing the songs you like um read the verses the scriptures that you like and discuss the things that you like because see i've been a preacher's wife for 50 years and i have to tell you that one of the challenges of a preacher is to appeal to a a whole lot of people and make the service palatable to everybody not just uh, one particular interest so uh, the corporate worship is going to suit everybody so they're going to have generalized sermons and generalized prayers and generalized everything so that uh so everyone is served and of course the the reason we gather is to uh, for the memorial service to partake of the lord's supper but this is why one of the reasons why your daily life has to be so much more purposeful and dedicated so that you don't depend on that sunday morning because it can let you down too maybe you'll hear a sermon doesn't apply to you at all or maybe you just uh you just somehow the uh 
the singing or anything it just didn't quite touch you and it's because it's very hard sometimes in a large group to appeal to everyone and we are we are obligated to be dedicated just as dedicated on the rest of the week too so I'm going to start out also with um, I talked to you last time about mind clutter and how we can get rid of the mind clutter and some of it is of course the amount of knowledge that's coming in all over the place and uh, how to eliminate that and restrict yourself to just what you what benefits you and what you would like and what builds you up and one of the uh, things I was discovering about mind clutter is how uh, I, I call it detox remember mind detox well for me mind detox is to clean up a clutter uh, an area of clutter that that distresses me every time I walk past it so when I get finished talking to you I'm going to have to go and do what I'm told and do what I told you to do <laughs> I've got uh, some piles of things that need to be put away and some clutter that needs to be um, worked through so to detox your mind then all you have to do is go through some clutter every day I have a box of papers I need to go through and some I have to go clean the kitchen and that actually relieves the mind now to give children a a purpose in all this a lot of times kids grow up in homes where they feel like they're just helping their parents um, they're just doing things because their parents told them to and they don't feel like there's a real purpose in it but if you can teach that this is going to help you develop uh, as a person in excellence to have an excellent spirit and to do things in an excellent way and if you can keep a notebook for them which uh, which shows them the progress they've made in any work at home and then at the end of a week you can get together or a month and get together and say now I see uh, you've progressed in this job at home and I want to really praise you for that and for that reason then if you'd like to choose something else that you that you would like to try to do at home uh, whatever skill you'd like to learn at home with uh, homemaking or home repair or anything then we can go on to that and you're not just going to have if you get an attitude that you have the kids until they're 18 and, and I have to take care of them and I, my main job is just to protect them and feed them properly and take care of them that's rather uh, that's rather animalistic you know you do that to a sheep <laughs> you do that to a dog or a cat but for a child you have to develop them intellectually and spiritually and um, teach them how to be happy in a good way and so we've gone through some of that but one of the things you can do is homeschool them and then they can learn so much about it um, but I wanted to read from uh, the third elect electric eclectic reader which I have been going through bit by bit and I had marked a place to go through and it is called uh, lesson let's see 10 20 32 lesson 32 they use uh, Roman numerals lesson 32 advantages of reading now have you ever thought of this that when uh, your your government starts taking over education and they introduce a strange way of learning how to read that is, tends to handicap more people rather than help them they're actually going against God now this explains it right here I hadn't really thought of this until I began homeschooling that one of the reasons God wants us to teach our children to read and write well is because we need to read God's Word and we need to be able to write and transfer it to other people or and we need to communicate with our loved ones because that's part of God's will too to honor them so if you're writing to your parents or your grandparents it's essential that you do your absolute best and learn to write intelligently to them and to uh, be able to appeal to them in uh, a stimulating way because young people should somehow and stimulate the thinking of the older people and the older people can pass on their uh, what what I would say their their way of being settled and um, being uh, good natured and things like that that they have developed over the years we we all 
we all benefit from each other. Uh, we be benefit from the um, energy and the stimulation of the young, and the young benefit from the wisdom and the the uh, the calmness and settled settledness of the older. So advantages of reading. Rule. There's always a rule at the beginning of these chapters. And I like the rule better than I like any of the information. So what I would do is I'll just tell you, since I'm homeschooling you, and I don't care how old you are, um, you're not too old. And uh, so here's the rule. When you read, uh, be careful to articulate distinctly. Now that was one of the rules of a previous chapter that I read to you. But listen to this sentence here. Nothing is more disagreeable and improper than to mumble the words. Now, one thing you have probably noticed in your life, even if you're very young, is that one of the purpose of mumbling words is to say something you shouldn't say and get away with it. Have you noticed this? And when we had the, I guess we called it the valley girl talk, where they would speak very rapidly and slur one word into the other, that was a language that was designed to keep parents from hearing what their children were actually saying, especially the older children. And so I love this. Nothing is more disagreeable and improper than to mumble words. This was written in 1837. You know, things haven't changed. We have the same problems to get over with. And even back in the 1800s, I was reading an old book that was talking, it was an etiquette book, and it was a etiquette of the time. It didn't really apply today, but one thing did, and that was that uh, people have to be careful about mumbling words and that it is very rude. Well, why did they say it was rude? Because it's a way of hiding what you're saying. And you can be answering someone and you got to, you answered, uh, but they didn't quite hear it distinctly. And it's a rebellion in a way. So when you read, be careful to, to articulate distinctly. Nothing is more disagreeable and improper than to mumble words. I, um, sometimes don't say things grammatically correct here when I'm talking because and I don't uh, edit I don't edit because it, it's so time consuming my time is so limited and I don't want to spend another hour on the the post after I've already spent an hour here talking to you so uh, because if you were here and you were and I was speaking to you and you had come for a lesson or for uh, for tea and I, I had a subject and I was talking to you about, you'd have to filter out some of the mistakes and just kind of edit it mentally yourself. So that's what you'll have to do because I, I don't go back, if I can help it, and, and edit it. So back to the idea that I put forth that it's God's will that we learn to read. And that's why we have to keep an eye on the reading methods of the schools. And if possible, keep your kids completely out of the school. If you took your child out of the school and they were just home and they was just made uh, to have a, a month or two free of not, not studying and not doing anything, and they learn to keep themselves clean and they learn to speak di distinctly and then they learn to read again. I don't care how old they are. If they could learn to read phonetically again, this would be more valuable than all the years in school. Because once you have the tools of reading and writing and arithmetic, then you can go on and learn on your own. You can be self-taught. Because once you have those tools, you can start reading things, looking at things. And also, another valuable skill is to learn from people how to do things. People that know how to do things, just ask them and watch them. And another valuable skill is to observe in silence. Observe how things work in silence. Observe how people uh, build things, make things, do things, organize things, and just observe in silence. That is a skill too. Okay. It is the glory of man that the Creator has made him capable to endless improvement in knowledge, virtue, and happiness. Now, of course, happiness has a different, uh, it's not the same as pleasure. It has a different meaning in these old books as people would think today. It is the high privilege of those who dwell in this favored land that they enjoy in rich abundance the means of such improvement. Now you'll notice uh, the words such improvement. 
and endless improvement. You will notice those words in some of the Jane Austen books. It, this was written at the same time, and this was a common expression, such improvement. Remember, Mr. Darcy talked about the improvement of her mind by the reading of good books. Among these means, books hold a prominent place. Now, I would say in this modern time, be careful of books. And uh, like they say, don't judge a book by its cover. It might look like quite a beautiful book. And then you get into it and you start reading it. And there are a lot of things that you object to. There was a book the other day that I thought was nice. And I was reading it. And it was about, oh, I know what it was about. It was for children. I was going through my old books and I found this one about the woods. You know, how to have a, a day in the woods and what to do with twigs and what to do with leaves and how to make things and and uh, how to entertain yourself and how to have a day outside but it was so full of evolution and anti-god teaching that uh, one of the things you can do with these books that you don't want anymore like I say just because it's a book don't be proud of yourself because you read it because it might not have been a good book and that's one of the things we have to teach our children just because it's a book it's not one that's that's profitable for us or uh, appropriate for us uh, but one of the things you can do with some of these old books instead of uh, throwing them away is uh, you can use them for scrapbooks you can paste beautiful papers in them and since they're already bound and they have uh, they have a spine and everything they call these smash books because they start putting things in them papers and uh, scrapbook paper paraphernalia and then they smash them all together and uh, so you can use them however if you have young people around young children around and they've left these books for them to read sometimes it's a bad influence and they get an idea in their head and it'll stick there and they'll use it when they're ready to uh, uh, resist uh, when they're ready to resist a standard and sometimes people go through this, even older people, they'll start getting to where they don't want uh, a standard around. They don't want to deal with it. And so anyone that has a standard or any book that has a standard, they'll start rejecting it and they'll start using all the little bits of uh, bad information and lies and uh, rebellious friends and things people have told them over the years to start collecting that all up and then they start to resist. So we want to be careful what books we keep in our homes that they are wholesome and useful. Among these means, books hold a prominent place. They are indeed our principal instructors and perhaps do more in the formation of our intellectual and moral habits than all other means combined. You know, that's, we could just stop right there, and uh, I would make the student ponder on that sentence. They are indeed our principal instructors, and perhaps do more in the formation of our intellectual and moral habits than all other means combined. And of course, these books were not taught in the 1950s or the 1940s. I think that McGuffey Reader was gotten rid of about the time the public schools got uh, taken over by the government and financed by the government and uh, so what a, what a pity that is because see I never heard this when I was growing up but my children got to have it and I'm somewhat jealous of them because I missed out on it and what a difference it would have made in my thinking and I believe that an education like this prevents depression uh, not to say that people don't get depressed who are highly uh, uh, spiritual or anything like that because we had Moses, we had Elijah, we had uh, several people throughout the Old and New Testament, um, but it would prevent unnecessary uh, lethargy. As books are of very various character, some good, and some indifferent, and some of a positively pernicious tendency, it is plainly a matter of great importance to make a wise selection of them and to read them with due caution. Especially is this true in regard to young persons and those whom the active, active duties of life leave but little leisure for reading. This is, this is so important. Never ever emphasize to me they would turn us loose in the library. The teachers would and say, oh, you know, go read. And some of the things that were in there were not very appropriate. 
one book read thoroughly and with all careful, careful reflection will do more to improve the mind and enrich the understanding than skimming over the surface of a whole library. Indeed, the more one reads in this hasty, superficial manner, the worst. It is like loading the stomach with a great quantity of food which lies there undigested, it enfeebles the intellect and pours darkness and confusion over all the operations of the mind. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful paragraph. And that is why I am reading to you this Jane Austen diet book because I want to read, read it page by page and paragraph by paragraph instead of just looking through that and think, oh, that sounds interesting. Oh, that looks good. And, and I do this with a lot of books because I have so many that I didn't read them all. And... So I was very thankful that my children would read the homeschool books paragraph by paragraph and then get enthused and come to me where I was working in the kitchen. I didn't stand over them all the time and say, listen to this. And they were such good books that they absorbed the children's mind and they weren't anxious to quit school. They weren't anxious to put it away. And at night you'd, you'd find them uh, with one of those books uh, across their chest, especially the A. Becca History and Geography book and the A. Becca science book. There was another science book put out by Christian Liberty, which they really liked. And there were several patriotic type books about, you know, uh, the history and the Constitution and the Declaration and things like that, that they loved because they would explain it in detail. And so that's why I'm reading this so carefully to you. So I'm reading the chapter on the universal truths back to Austin's body basics. Now remember last time I read to you about how um, everybody is different and how one size doesn't fit all. And I feel that way about just about everything, about food, skin care, about, um, about medicine, about health about your home and your homemaking, uh, everybody's a, a different. Everybody need, has different needs. And so, so I wanted to just say one more thing about mental detox and how reading helps it. If you could just read a paragraph aloud, sometimes your mind can settle down. But you get up in the morning, all of us have a, a dwelling place or a home, and even if you live in a tent, it can be overwhelming because everything needs to be cleaned up. Everything needs to be neat and tidy. And uh, you, you wake up with confusion sometimes. But if you could mentally detox by making the place where you are now working or engaged in neat and tidy. Now, one of the fallouts of this is that somebody's going to accuse you of being obsessed. Oh, you're obsessive compulsive because you want to uh, prepare a, a meal and have everything, you know, put things back, put ingredients back as you use them and wipe the surface down and, and wash a dish and they'll look at you and say, you're, you're just, um, you're just obsessive. Why don't you just, you know, wait and, you know, throw them all in at once and, and they will, they will try to run you down. But if your mind works better and this is a better mental balance for you then you do that but you will run into this uh attitude i have seen it i've seen it all since the since i was born um and i'm 70 years old now i have seen it all and perhaps that's why i did not panic when all this when all this tyrannic tyranny started because i've seen it all because i've seen tyranny and communism in a little in little ways there's been little tyrannical dictators running around my life all my life uh whether it was a student in the school or whether it was uh, somebody telling you what to do or whatever i've i've heard it all and one of the things people like to do is discourage you if you want to better yourself if you want to uh, improve the you know get the clutter out of the way and keep your workspace neat and be you know take a little extra time to put something back or to neaten something as you go they're going to mock you and this began uh it shocked me when it first started and i don't know where it was coming from well i think i do know where it was coming from it was to, from keeping people so busy they didn't have time to put things away so they began to mock people who had the time to to look at into details, to pay attention to details, and 
and it could have began in places that I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings so I don't want to tell you exactly but it's very rude and uh, so one of the things you can do for mental detox is to keep the area you're working the space you're working in very neat and tidy so universal truth number three from the Jane Austen diet by Brian Kozlowski you know who's been an he's become an honorary member of the family um, for a while anyway so I'm going to read this to you now and uh, I have been so influenced by what he has written that I've taken it to heart and even if it's still a little dark outside I will get bundled up and go out there just to make sure I get out there before the family starts uh, wanting to eat or go to the kitchen I want to do that before just to experience it if you haven't already noticed, health isn't a narrow matter of weight in Austin world. Not that weight didn't matter to Jane. Her novels certainly contain their fair share of corpulent characters. Corpulent, remember that? My children learned that word in homeschool was corpulent. <laughs> uh, cor corpulent characters who could afford to lose a few pounds. Ahem, Mr. Hurst, Dr. Grant, Mrs. Musgrove. I understand in the book Sandenton, which I still haven't read, I, I don't know how to get a hold of that one, but apparently it was an unfinished novel, just like Elizabeth Gaskell had an unfinished novel, and it was Wives and Daughters, but knowing that she believed in happy endings, the editors wisely had it end happily, and uh, I was trying to think of another, uh, wouldn't it be nice, you know, you should all leave an unfinished novel. <laughs> That could be your one claim to fame to your descendants is the unfinished novel. Um, because all of these people, Jane Austen and Elizabeth Gaskell, had unfinished novels that everyone's so fascinated with. But in Sandington, apparently there was a corpulent person there um, who, when he was, he was described as when he was exercising or running on the beach, that he was so completely out of breath he, he almost collapsed. But it wasn't the end-all indicator of health that it's become for us, reflected in the fact that whenever I told my more historically-minded friends that I was writing a Jane Austen diet book, I would usually brace for the requisite snicker. But Austen didn't even have a bathroom scale. Touché! Austen was denied the modern luxury of stepping onto a scale to get a daily reminder of how heavy she was to the accuracy of an ounce. But that, incidentally, made all the difference. I have to stop and comment on that. Because the scale is a big liar. <laughs> because even though my clothes, uh, I can now fit into some of my daughter's clothes, uh, barely, uh, the weight doesn't show that. <laughs> it doesn't show uh, the weight. The weight is just not accurate. It's the, uh, it's the measuring tape, the inches that are accurate. And also the muscle, uh, the muscle mass, like my arms have changed, you know, and uh, so that's what's important, and, and my health too. It freed Austin to see something our health by numbers culture has practically forgotten. Health isn't anything we need a scale to reveal. That's, that's true. It's something our bodies manifest naturally if we only pay attention. Austin explains it best in Emma when Mrs. Weston can't help but notice how well Emma looked last night. There is health, she says, evident in most every physical feature. Emma's eyes are clear and brilliant. Her skin radiates with full health. Her figure is firm, read fit, and her size is undeniably pretty. Mrs. Weston is rephrasing the mainstream medical idea of the Regency era, though one still as relevant today, that health is far more than, more holistic than a number between our toes or a range on a BMI chart. It encompasses the way you look, manifest in Emma's radiant face and figure, and also the way you feel, equally evident in Emma's lively energy and happy disposition. Mrs. Weston calls it the whole complete picture of health, always far more important to Austin 
than focusing on any one isolated factor. Let's not forget that Jane knew her English far better than we do. Health literally means whole from the old English hail. Ah, that's nice, isn't it? See, you learned a new word. Kids, you're doing well. Health means whole from old English hail. Well, that must be why some people are calling it holistic health. And, uh... So, if you ever wondered why Austin characters so frequently keep tabs on people's physical and emotional looks, this is why. They are excellent clues for determining whether they are either in health or drifting dangerously out of health, a lesson we can certainly benefit from today. Fewer guilt trips to our bathroom scales compels us to pay closer attention to our own realistic and bigger picture of health, how our clothes fit, how our skin looks, how our bodies and minds feel. This this is really important because the scale can make you so anxious. And what you have to do, especially if you're a young woman, is realize that your weight is going to fluctuate um, all through the month is going to fluctuate. You'll have thinner days and you will have some days where you're not so thin and and the weight really has nothing to do with really how you are and uh, how things fit. I have learned that because I've been trying to dodge this certain mark on the scale for a long time and it won't, <laughs> it won't move. There's something wrong with the scale. <laughs> and, uh, and the clothes that don't fit, you know, these clothes, they just get smaller all the time. <laughs> Don't you know? They shrink after you keep them around for a while. <laughs> Considered as a whole and not just a number, it remains the most reliable measure of health in both Austin world and our own. So he's just saying uh, that the way that your clothes fit and the way you feel... And that is what your health is. I will tell you the whole story. Look at the whole story of your health through Austin's holistic eyes. Hop off the scale and start noticing the various body clues Jane recognized as being part of the bloom of full health. Skin. Improving in health in Austin world always entails noticing that your complexion is so improved too. Jane usually identifies this as a natural glow and enhanced plumpness to the skin, which is why gaining a little health, a little weight, is oftentimes a good thing in Jane's novels. In Northanger Abbey, Catherine grows more beautiful, her complexion improved when her features were softened by plumpness and color. Well, of course, I think we're in an era where the... Uh, the food and the ingredients have been um, genetically modified so much that it's, it's very hard for us to understand thinness because most people have never suffered from it. And uh, But I think we're headed for the direction of nat more natural eating and more natural living now, and especially what I have uh, found to be so beneficial is the fresh air and the, the walking. Uh, what was it Darcy said about as Elizabeth, about um, Elizabeth or Jane, he, she said her, her complexion was brightened by the exercise because she had such a long walk. And so I just wanted to say something about my skin care because I have very troubled skin. And um, I just wanted to tell you that one size does not fit all. I I had to quit using, using any kind of commercial skin care products and resorted to whatever was in my kitchen and I have sweet almond oil which I mix with a drop of frankincense for frankincense is for the troubled skin and uh, sometimes I'll I'll make a little bit of it and put it in a, a, a spray bottle or a bottle and and use that but I just make a tiny bit at a time so that it doesn't spoil and I'll use that on my skin uh, now some people they they wouldn't like uh, sweet almond oil or they might want to use coconut oil or something like that on their skin and just uh, I'm thinking avocado oil something like that if you need to have some kind of skin care I also use for uh, for blemishes and for balance uh, a little cotton ball 100% cotton cotton ball with uh, with uh, 
apple cider vinegar, pure apple cider vinegar, and use that as a toner or a, an astringent. And uh, But not everybody, don't take what I do, find out what works for you. And this has taken me a long time to figure this out. Skin. Improving in health in Austin world always entails noticing that your complexion is so improved too. Now remember I read this before. Jane usually identifies this as a natural glow and enhanced plumpness to the skin, which is why gaining a little weight is oftentimes a good thing in Jane's novels. In Northanger Abbey, Catherine grows more beautiful, her complexion improved. Okay, size. Austin's healthiest heroines never fluctuate dramatically in their weight, preferring to remain at their slimmest size for rational happiness. Going much beyond this genetic sweet spot, growing either too thin or too heavy looking for your individual body type, is an indicator of being out of health. Appetite. Are you enjoying a healthy appetite? Having a guiltless and rational relationship with food is a crucial component of being in a good state of health. I have found the best way to have guiltless food is to just make it from the best, highest um, quality ingredients you possibly can. If you're going to have some ice cream, make it yourself. I do have a recipe for ice cream somewhere. If you're going to have uh, some chocolate, make it yourself and from uh, the basic, basic ingredients. And, uh, and enjoy it without guilt. Uh, one of the things that the modern diet movement has done to so many of us is we can't enjoy anything. We don't like uh, diet food. We don't like to go on a diet. And uh, so we're miserable that way. But then when we eat what we want, then we're made to feel miserable anyway. So it's just really bad what they've done to our eating. And it's caused a lot of, of disorders. Energy. No character in Austin world enjoys health without also enjoying great energy. Feeling a daily surge of life and vigor, reveling in the felicity of a brisk walk or a lively dance, are some of Jane's most important indicators of overall health. Inversely, chronic weariness and a weakened frame point just as strongly to ill health. Spirits. As health increases, so too should your mood. Good health and happy spirits are intimately linked for Jane, part of her deeper understanding of the mind-body connection. See chapter 7. That was one of my favorites to read, was the mind-body connection. When happiness is absent, something important has been left out of Austin's whole story of health, no matter what the scale says. That Jane chose to espouse this whole picture of health is even more fascinating considering that she could have stepped onto a scale if she really wanted to. There was indeed a certain vogue for weighing oneself in the Regency era. Though the process was a wee bit humiliating, it involved waddling down to the nearest London warehouse and hopping onto a massive hanging scale. The type usually reserved for weighing heavy wine barrels because who doesn't like to be the butt of a few body barrel jokes. <laughs> Slightly upping the embarrassment was the fact that the group of goggling onlookers were often standing by, snickering and waiting for the loud announcement of your weight. Needless to say, for most people, this was a novelty, a gag, a one-off experience reserved strictly for the curious and the courageous. One of the, those moments when you could have bought and I survived weighing myself like a barrel <laughs> t-shirt in the gift shop. For others, however, it became a dark spiral for focusing on health as a number in the weight cost of everything else. Now, I was reading in Linda Lichter's book, Simple Social Graces, about the Victorian era, that clothing for a woman, uh, they had so many layers of clothing that the clothing itself could weigh 10 pounds. So, uh, I don't know if people would have kept that in account or not, but the clothing itself would have taken up a lot of energy just to wear the clothing. Uh, would have been like carrying a stack of books or carrying an armload of kindling into your house because you would be carrying 10 pounds around. So probably would have been exercise itself just in the amount of clothing you would have worn. The Regency poet, 
poet was one of the first victims of this dark side scales. Lord Byron, in 1806, he stepped onto a hanging scale at a wine merchant's shop in London and discovered it was exactly 194 pounds. Deeply humiliated, he became hyper-obsessed with lowering that number, putting himself on an endless round of dangerous starvation diets until he lost over 70 pounds confirmed again by another compulsive trip to the hanging scale. He continued this damaging cycle of yo-yo dieting until his d early death at 36 years old, a consequence many historians now believe due to abusing his body by obsessively, obsessively focusing on weight. Byron eventually sus suspected the same. Over-dieting, he finally realizes, was the cause of more than half our maladies. Obviously, the poor guy wasn't reading Jane Austen. Okay, let me look over my notes before I finish up here for today. Um, I wanted to talk, to, uh, we're going to end there, and the next, the next section is Universal Truth number four, Strong Already. So I just want to mention a couple of things before I quit, and, uh, and, and you can get on your day. Um, that... Greatness. We always uh, we are obsessed with the idea of greatness, and even uh, mistakenly raise our children, telling them they have to be great. But greatness, from what I've been reading in this book and in the Bible and in the old school books, greatness is the ability to enjoy the life that God gave you, the ability to be happy that you are here and that knowing that you have a purpose. And uh, greatness is enjoying your own garden, your own backyard, your own country, your own couch, uh, your own heritage, and uh, your own nationality, and, uh, you know, going to the beach, hiking, uh, doing a barbecue in your backyard. This is, these are things worth having freedom for. And being able to teach your children what you believe and where you came from and where your people came from. This is what greatness is all about. Learning a skill, learning to, uh, one of my greatest things that I thought was greatness was learning to sew. That was such a blessing for me to learn to sew. I always wanted to do it. I saw my mother sewing and my grandmother sewing and I wanted to figure it out, figure out more about it. And it has been such a blessing for me because I think every woman at home has to have something they do that doesn't have anything to do with uh, cleaning up and, and the homemaking, but just doing something because it gives them uh, some happiness. And I have enjoyed the sewing, and uh, since then I've kind of um, laid off of it. I haven't done it as much, but uh, having greatness is not about being famous and being on a magazine or being uh, in the movies or on stage or anything like that and but greatness is like what I read to you when I first began and it was uh, Colossians 3 verses 23 and 24 this is a great statement if you could somehow ponder on this and write it on the tablet of your heart Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward, you, for you serve the Lord Christ. And when you realize greatness could be just be in doing something well, just doing small things well, or just being a nice, being nice, just being nice. This is the kind of greatness that we need today. So ladies... I thank you for your prayers and I thank you for coming and listening and for leaving a comment. You encourage me a great deal. And please go to the post where this is. I've left a link for you. I don't have comments on the channel, but you can leave a comment there. And so I'll see you next time. Bye.